Friends, good morning. It's Friday. Yep. December 17th. What kind of... What is that? Is that like rain, sir? Is that rain, sir? A little bit of rain. Like that much. Uh, 906. Let's head over to the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands here where we have Tomas Manglotnia, who's standing by. He's our regional correspondent on all things CNMI. Tomas, good morning. Good morning, Chris, Jason, Joe, sir. Yes, I uh, wanted to kick off uh, the news update with uh, the CNMI House Speaker's uh, telling interview yesterday. We uploaded the full interview with Edmund Villagomez on our YouTube channel to uh, for our viewers to view. Uh, and yesterday, he uh, did comment that uh, for the first time in Commonwealth history, uh, a contempt charge from the legislative branch has been waged and uh, issued against the sitting governor, Rob Torres, of course, uh, who filed a lawsuit shortly after uh, to essentially avoid the subpoena. Uh, it's yet to be seen uh, when that will be scheduled to be heard by the Superior Court. Uh, of course, uh, the um, uh, House Speaker Villa Gomez telling us that uh, he hopes that uh, there is some action with regards to the certification that was sent to the Attorney General, Edward Manabusen. Uh, something that we also discussed with uh, the Speaker Villa Gomez uh, in the NMI is that uh, it's obviously an election season. Uh, Governor Torres has decided uh, to run for re-election with uh, with Senator Vinny and uh, Tina Sablon, who's a vocal member of the House Committee, uh, it is also running as a Democrat. And this this has become uh, part of the political atmosphere here in the CNMI. So I wanted to share uh, part of our interview uh, addressing some of that uh, with Speaker Edmund Villa Gomez from the House of Representatives here in the CNMI. The concern that they see and they want to report to the body um, it's it's within their it's within the rules and it's within their duties and responsibilities. So um, yeah, I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see as time goes on. And uh, you know, I know of course the governor has come out and announced that he is running. And then also on the legislative side, you have Tina Sablan, who's who's uh, you know who's been selected to run for governor and has declared that she she's going to be running for governor. So no matter how neutral or objective you try to make it look, just the, the fact that there are contenders on one branch, there's a contender in one branch and a contender in another branch, you know, it's, it's already looked at as, a, you know, there's some political stuff going on. So it, it's, really, it's really up to the viewers and the, the constituents watching this uh, uh, how the impact is, um, but I think it, it it also comes down to those individuals, I guess, vying for that seat. We actually got a, an exclusive interview with Lieutenant Governor Arnold Palacios, who is currently in Hawaii for uh, medical reasons this morning. We'll have the full report tonight on primetime. Yesterday in the afternoon, though, uh, he released a statement of his own addressing the lawsuit and addressing the investigation into the governor. Of course, Governor Palash, uh, Lieutenant Governor Palash is running for governor next year with Saipan Mayor David Apatang. Uh, but in his letter yesterday to the media, he writes, all this time, energy and money being spent on fighting the subpoena could be put to better use. He added, the public deserves an explanation, nothing less. They have the right to know the truth because after all, it is their money. And he says with an exclamation point, enough already. And so uh, we got a chance to uh, chat with uh, Lieutenant Governor Palacios and we'll have that full report tonight on primetime. Uh, Chris, before signing off, did want to share the latest update with regards to the surge. We are seven weeks into this COVID surge here on Saipan. Uh, last night, the Commonwealth Healthcare Corporation reporting 88 new cases confirmed for COVID-19 from December 15. This brings the total case count in the NMI to 2,200 five since March of 2020. Uh, there are also 14 individuals who are hospitalized. Their status is nine unvaccinated, five vaccinated, one is on a ventilator, and one was discharged from the Commonwealth Healthcare uh, Hospital. Of the 88 cases, 63 were identified via contact tracing, and 25 were identified via community testing. Chris, I think it's important also just to remind folks uh, that of the total 2,205 cases, 1,914 of those were identified just in the past seven weeks. 
And so that's uh, the latest here in the CNMI person use. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, any word on uh, how Christmas is going to be in the NMI with uh, whatever restrictions are in place? No, it's not clear. The restrictions are expected to expire in the coming days. Uh, we were expecting to have a press conference with CNMI Governor Ralph Torres, who is currently on Guam for uh, what appears to be both personal and professional business. Uh, and uh, last we heard, uh, the press conference this morning was rescheduled to Monday because he has a meeting with Guam Governor Lulian Guerrero. So right. that meeting supposedly taking place right now between right now. the CNMI governor and the governor of Guam. Wow. Okay. So no word okay. on, on Christmas. Not, yeah, not no word. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're just sharing general updates, but also would be interesting to see what exactly is on their agenda as the two governors in the moment. Sure would. It sure would, my friend. Yeah. I uh, appreciate it, uh, Tomas. Thank you. Anything else uh, you want to throw out? Uh, we have a great story uh, coming up on our weekend edition of Primetime. Uh, we check in with a house owner, uh, Patrick Cepeda, who is the recipient of a fully reconstructed home from FEMA. Uh, they're reconstructing and repairing 288 homes that were impacted by the super typhoon U2. So we got, we got to speak with uh, FEMA officials at one of the model homes. And we also got to speak with Patrick, who just moved into his home recently. And Chris, it just brings a whole new meaning to the phrase home for the holidays. People are getting new homes that are built for typhoon in the future. And as we've seen these disasters in the nation, and of course, with the climate change conversation, um, it was just, let me tell you, I mean, I, you know, in this pandemic, uh, you kind of forget, right? It's easy to forget that we've also uh, been through so many other things as well. Um, and so uh, speaking with Patrick and uh, getting to learn more about the housing program was was great. So we'll bring you that story this weekend on Primetime. Got it. Thank you so much, Tomas. Excited to see that, my friend. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everyone. When are you coming back to Guam? I come back on Monday, Chris. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't bring no surge with you, okay? If you're bringing a surge to Guam, just stay over there. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. I'm coming from Saipan. From yeah, some, okay, from Saipan. so have, have, a, have a good 30-minute flight down here. Yeah, be safe. <laughs> I, will, I will. I'll let you know if anything happens. No fair getting <laughs> jet and, lagged. And remember, once the captain turn, turns off the, the you can relax your seatbelt sign, he's going to turn it right back on. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, James. <laughs> anything, it's else, anything else, Jay? You good? Okay. <laughs> 913, this is the link. Uh, we've got to take a quick break. And uh, we're coming back and talking about cockfighting next on this Friday morning. Good morning. Join well, I didn't get screamed because I was just afraid of it. I procrastinated. I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't have insurance. 